Hello, my lovelies, and welcome to the Moving Toward Better podcast. I'm your host, Karen Bemis from movingtowardbetter.com, and I'm here to help you live your best life and let the rest go. Hello, my lovelies. Today we're talking about how to make your good morning wishes come true, which actually starts the night before. Honestly, the first time I heard this, I rolled my eyes, just like some of you probably are right now. But I promise if you hear me out, especially if you're not a morning person, this can truly change your life. I'm gonna give you a list of things to do each night that can truly make a huge difference in your morning. And it's okay if you're skeptical. I was skeptical too, but I am not kidding when I tell you this list is transformative. And you don't have to do it right before bed. You can do it immediately after dinner, or you can start it in the afternoon and do a little bit as you go. Adapt it to your lifestyle. That's the whole point of this. But I promise, If you add these few things to your list, that honestly, the whole thing combined takes somewhere around 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes on a bad day, your life is going to be better. Your mornings are going to be better. I'm telling you, it's crazy, but it works. So number one, we're going to do something called a two minute tidy. Pick a room, probably your living room, your kitchen, somewhere like that. Two minutes, two focused minutes every day. Look y'all, I can't stress enough how much this can change your life. When you can get up in the morning and see even a little bit of improvement in your home, it elevates everything about your day. You are gonna feel more accomplished before you even get started. And then you get to build your self-esteem in two tiny minutes out of your day. Even if you have years of clutter to get rid of, two minutes per day adds up to 60 minutes per month. If you're drowning in clutter, when was the last time you spent 60 minutes clearing your clutter? If you have piles and piles of clutter, I'm guessing it wasn't recently. Now, the one thing about tidying up is things have to have a home And if they don't have a home, why not? I've noticed what a lot of people do when they say this tidying up doesn't work for me is that they're just moving their junk around. The junk doesn't have a home. Why does it have a home? If you're just moving totes from room to room, you're not tidying up. You're just moving your mess. And there is a difference. So I'm talking about truly tidying up. Pick up the, pick up the trash, put things away. If something doesn't have a home, give it a home and not a home in a stack in another room, a true home. I honestly don't believe anybody needs to have bins and bins and bins and bins in their house. I tried that. It doesn't work. All you do is just keep collecting more stuff that you don't need. I'm telling you, I'm not telling you to be a minimalist. If you have things you love, keep them. But the stuff that you don't love and that you don't use it really, it's easier just to get rid of it. And I don't know uh, how things are where you are in the world, but right now things are starting. uh, I got something in the mail yesterday that they're starting to do charity pickups again. So for a lot of you, that may be an option again. Uh, Goodwill here in the United States is starting to open up. They're going to start taking donations again, things like that. So two minute tidy each day. Second, I want you to look at your calendar. More importantly, if you don't have one, get one. I know everybody's got a digital calendar these days. I have one, but do you share that with anybody? I don't. Maybe you have to share it with the people you work with. And if you never forget a commitment or find yourself scrambling to get to something, I know not too many of us have that issue right now. You know, for those who listen to this later, this is being recorded in the middle of, you know, we're starting to open up after a pandemic. So people don't have a lot on their calendars, but typically, at least in the United States, we do. And 
you need a central place that you can have all of that information. And that's where a paper calendar comes in really handy. I do actually have a post about that. And if you check the show notes, it will link you to a blog post that has that that post listed in it. And I have some great ideas that I've gathered over the years about how to do a really fun family calendar. And you can even get your kids involved in it. And once they're on board, that really helps. Because you know what? There may be a birthday party on Saturday that if you see it when you look at it, you're like, oh, I have to get a gift for that. Instead of on your calendar, your digital calendar, where it has a notification maybe the day before, usually an hour before where you're like, oh no, I got to go do something about this. So if you're super organized, you don't even need this stuff anyway. But if you're not, this is going to really, really help you. You need to put that calendar somewhere that you look at it every day. Do not put it on a desk or on a table. Post it. Mine's been on a refrigerator with magnets for years. I know other friends who use a push pin and stick it in their wall. It doesn't have to be something fancy. It just has to be somewhere that it's hanging, that you're going to look at it and look at it frequently. That way you see it often. You've got those reminders right there in your face. And trust me, when you've got multiple children, this is a game changer. I also have a link in the show notes that will show you what my favorite calendar is. It's nice and big. You can fit lots of stuff in it. It's affordable. And best of all, it doesn't go from January to December. (laughs) How's that for interesting? So check that. Be sure to check that out. Number three, write down your next day's to-do list. Do I hear a collective, ugh, you know? I used to detest this part of the day because it always seemed like the list was huge and there was no way I could ever get it all done. And it was never done. That was the worst part. And it made me feel like a failure as a mom, a wife, keeper of the house, you name it. So here's the secret of a to-do list. Simplification. Do you really have to do everything on the list? What would happen if you didn't do it all? Do you have to be the one to do it all or to do everything on that list? It amazes me how many parents do not have their children help out around the house. I've had my kids help out for years. They don't even have to do a lot. It's just if everybody does a little, a lot gets done, especially over time. I'm not kidding when I say that from two years old, my kids helped with age appropriate tasks. And yes, a two year old can run a vacuum sweeper. And my youngest, that used to be his favorite thing to do. That was the task he would choose whenever he could. He really enjoyed it. Now, was it perfect? No, but it was better than when he started. And I would tell him, go for all the little pieces, find your little pieces, sweep them all up. How many can you get? And he had a blast doing it. And at that time, my other two boys were five and eight and they were doing other age appropriate things. We had a deal in the summertime. We would spend 15 minutes cleaning up and then we would move on with our day. I've talked about that in other podcasts and it was great for them because They didn't have to do lots of things all every day. I had a list that each could pick up to three items. How much can we get done in that 15 minutes? There were certain things and you're going to have certain things too that you're not going to want your kids to do. One of the things I didn't let my kids do was clean a toilet. That one I reserved for me because I wanted to know it was very, very clean. (laughs) Other things, dusting, wiping down walls, things like that, wiping down baseboards, I was a lot more lax about that and what it looked like. Sometimes you have to give up some perfectionism to make progress. And that's what we did with this. So the to-do list got done a lot faster because of it, which is really, really cool. All right. Number four, if you leave the house the next day, whether it's for school, daycare, work, and you pack lunches, pre-pack your lunches the night before. 
This one fires people up for whatever reason. And I find that hilarious. <laughs> people get really fired up about it. Now, my kids were lunch packers and I am not a fan of packing lunches in the morning. I like my mornings to be really smooth, simple, quiet. I I don't like a lot of hustle and bustle, even though I'm a morning person. Just because I'm up doesn't mean I'm ready to hustle and bustle. And I'm a hustle bustle kind of person. My kids, even less so than I am, they are not morning people, which made it really hard because they could never decide what they wanted or they always wanted something that I didn't have. And it got to just be this real mess. And we were fussing about it and all that. And my kids didn't like the same things. And I could have been that mom who's like, you're getting peanut butter and jolly and you'll like it. Or you're getting turkey and you'll like it. Well, my kids didn't like that. And, you know, there are some kids you can say, eat it or go hungry. Well, my kids would have gone hungry. If you had seen how skinny my kids were, that was not a good thing. (laughs) One of my children was in the 10th percentile for weight almost his whole life. And if you add to that, that my older two were athletes and one of them was in marching band and he lost nearly 10 pounds every year during band camp. And that was with me packing a lunch and him getting a solid dinner. So... You know, I think that kind of explains why I wanted them to have a lunch they were happy to eat. And my youngest one, oh, we fought to put every ounce on that kid because he has he has a medical condition that makes it difficult. It made him made it very difficult for him to gain weight. So it's an interesting tip that I found. I can't remember where I learned this, but if your kids like lunch meat sandwiches, you can make enough for a week and freeze them. I used to do this. I would make, on Sunday nights, I would make five sandwiches each. Four would go in the freezer. One would go in the fridge. And then you can either each night get one out, or in the morning, you can get them out frozen, and they'll be thawed by lunch, I promise you. And they keep the lunch cool. So it worked out really, really well if they had things like fruit or something like that, that it wouldn't get all mushy and and warm. Now, I had one that liked peanut butter and jelly. So I would actually make that. I made it every evening because I was better at that. And then I would put it in the fridge overnight. And he was fine with that. The other thing I did was I bought prepackaged items for my boys to choose from. And while I understand, you know, I compost and I recycle and I understand that that's not the most ecologically friendly option, I needed to get my kids to eat. This way, I didn't have to fight about what was in their lunch. They would grab a snack. They would grab a fruit or a vegetable. They would grab a sandwich and they would get something to drink at school, milk or juice or something like that. Now, here's a little bonus tip for you. One of the things my kids loved, particularly when they got in junior high and high school, was leftover pizza. They did not care if it was cold, not even a little bit. So we would order a pizza. We would actually order two pizzas on Sunday. They could have some for dinner. And then we packaged everything up for the rest of the week. And some weeks they would have pizza. That was very easy. (laughs) I really appreciated that. Number five. Now, I know a lot of people aren't doing this right now, but putting the homework folders in the backpack and going through the backpack to make sure there's nothing to sign that might be in there. Now, I honestly don't know if schools still send home permission slips and reading logs and things like that, but nothing throws off a well-planned morning more than, well, there's two things, finding shoes and, you know, kids going, mom, I have a permission slip you forgot to sign, or you gotta fill out this paper, or I'm gonna get in trouble, just as you're trying to get them out the door. Been there, done that, my friends. When we're back to school, do yourself this favor. Make this part of your nightly routine and you will thank me later. (laughs) I know it sounds like common sense to most of you, but trust me, I was one of those moms who had to learn to put that on my list and not leave it up to my kids to tell me 
when I had paperwork to sign or to fill out. Just as an example, first PTO meeting in 2011, so we're talking nine years ago, they started talking about the first day packet. And I was like, first day packet? And this was my fir- the first time I had been to the first meeting of the year because I had younger children. So this was the first time I could actually go that early in the morning, as early in the morning as they were having it because I had an elementary school child who went to school later. So I said something about, I was like, first day packet. And people went, wait, you didn't get the first day packet? I'm like, what first day packet? And they're like, well, everybody gets one. Didn't you, didn't your son bring it home? I'm like, I have two sons and neither one brought it home. (laughs) It was a big brown manila envelope and I didn't get it. So uh, the next year I was actually on the committee for that. So it was the first year I ever got the packet of four years of being at that high school. So fortunately by the end of those my 10 straight years at the high school, everything was digital. So hopefully you guys don't have to deal with that at the beginning of the year anymore. But that's why I share this, my friends, because I know there's others out there like me who you rarely, if ever, get those things. And if they come home with a younger child, (laughs) guaranteed I wasn't going to get it. So maybe a mood point, but maybe not. Number six, load the dishwasher and or wash the dishes. Now, this is the one that trips people up because they swear to me, they cannot get all the dishes done in 15 minutes. And I would have been one of those people saying the same thing until I met my mother-in-law. My mother and father-in-law raised nine children and only had a dishwasher for a very short time because my mother-in-law didn't like it. It took up too much space in her house, she said. For the first 10 years, my husband and I were together. We didn't have a dishwasher either. And I would have sworn that dishes took more than 15 minutes. The truth is that most nights I didn't finish the dishes. So I started behind the eight ball for the next day. Then I got a dishwasher and I blamed having stacked up dishes on the fact that it took so long to unload the dishwasher. (sighs) Because somebody did this for me, I'm going to do this for you and I'm going to call BS. And the reason I'm going to do that is because you deserve better than your current excuses. Friends, I timed how long it took to do the dishes for a family of five. On a difficult night, it took 15 minutes. Most nights, it took five to 10. If I cleaned as I cooked, definitely only about five. And that is a huge life hack right there. When you're getting ready to cook, run a sink of hot water and wash as you cook if you don't have a dishwasher, especially if there's a lot of prep work. This will improve everything you do in your kitchen. It will make everything go faster. If you happen to have a dishwasher, just load the dishwasher as you go. Then after dinner, it takes no time at all to finish the job. Friends, this is easy and it's simple. And I promise you, if you try it for a week, you will notice that your kitchen starts to look better. Don't wait until the last minute to do it though. Do those dishes right after dinner, whenever you can. Or have one parent do the dishes while the other parent goes and does the backpacks or something like that. Divide and conquer when you can. Now, if you're a single parent or you're a parent who's the other parent is out of town or something, I understand it may not, it may not go as easily, but again, smaller children, not teeny tiny ones, but smaller kids can help with this. They really and truly can. You might have to put away your inner perfectionist and your dishwasher might not be loaded perfectly, but it can be done. I'm telling you, it can be done. Number seven, pick out your clothes for the next day. This is a biggie, especially with kids. You can check out the weather together, plan an outfit, ask them what specials they have if they, if they go to school, you know, 
That way you can make sure that they're not going to wear a dress without shorts underneath when they're going to be climbing a rope the next day. You can make sure they're not wearing their favorite shirt if they're going to be painting in art class, things like that. If you have a child who changes their mind or is very good at choosing one thing one day and something else the next, here's the thing that you do. Instead of just having one outfit, lay out two. And then you can ask them in the morning, do you want to wear this one or this one? And if they say, I don't want to wear either one, say, I'm sorry, this is what you chose last night. Do you want to wear this one or this one? You may have a few days of resistance, but I guarantee you in the end, it will work out for you. And the reason I say this is because I have friends, relatives that have sent their kids to parochial schools. They have to wear a uniform every day. Kids get used to things like that. They like the routine of it. They will love being able to pick out all their special things that they can wear the next day. And you can add a little incentive when you say, if you get up and do this, we can do this with your hair. Or, you know, you might have time to read a book or play or do whatever. I would suggest do not turn on screens, but that's a discussion for another day. The other thing I would say is extra bonus points if you gather up the shoes that they're going to be wearing the next day to avoid the frantic morning shoe search. Nothing will drive you crazy than, mom, I can't find my shoes. And I wasn't big. My kids didn't like a lot of different shoes. They were just happy with their one pair of gym shoes. So if one was missing, we were in trouble. (laughs) So we always, we started making sure that those shoes were ready and they could put them on and out the door we went. Also, do this for yourself. You won't have to think about what meetings or commitments you have while you're standing there in the morning. Do it the evening before and you can plan everything out and it will practically automate the start of your day. I'm telling you, do this and you are going to thank me for it. It is one of the coolest things to make your mornings go really, really smoothly. And number eight, have a regular bedtime. Now, friends, if I'm being honest, and I'm going to be honest, I struggle with this one the most. (laughs) My husband travels off and on for business. And when he's gone, my inner night owl comes out to play. The problem with that is that my body is used to getting up early because I did it for 10 straight years with my kids. My kids had to be to school by 730 which meant they needed to leave the house by seven. And I wanted to be up early enough so that I was awake when they got up. I didn't want us all rolling out of bed at the same time. The other thing is then my husband started working as a construction manager. He often had to be at work by seven. So I would get up with him. So for about 10 years, I got up at 545 in the morning. I've adjusted a little bit and then my youngest son, they were gone, he was gone for a year and then moved back home because uh, financially he just didn't want to pay the money to live in a dorm. <laughs> so <laughs> he decided to move back home, which is fine with us. And he would, same thing. He had eight o'clock classes. He would have to be out early. So I've always been in the habit of getting up early. It throws things off when you stay up late and you get up early about Thursday, you're dragging so, so badly. And I know some of you are like, why in the world did you get up every day when your kids were in high school? They could get themselves ready. Yes, they could. And they did fine with that in college. So it's not like I was doing everything for my kids and not teaching them how to take care of themselves. But the reason that I did this is very personal. And it's Because of the shooting at Columbine High School in April of 1999, that day changed my life. It changed so much about me. And I write about that in my book, Everyday Heroes of Motherhood. I remember reading the stories about kids who called their parents moments before they were killed. And I thought about all the moms and dads, and I still get choked up this many years after when I think about it, All those mom and dads who might have been so busy that they rushed out to work or 
they left their kids with a harsh word that day. And I promised myself that day that that wouldn't be me. Now, I wasn't perfect. There were still a few days, you know, I raised three teenagers. There were still some days where those boys grudgingly, grudgingly listened to me say, I love you. And a couple days where they walked away and didn't say it back. And I said it when I wasn't in a loving mood, but I still said it. I said it no matter what, because I always felt like if my kids were ever in the same situation, I wanted them to know that the last words they ever heard from my mouth was that I love them. 99% of the time that they left this house, that's exactly what they heard. And to this day, it still is. As I said, Columbine was a huge part of the inspiration for the book that I wrote called Everyday Heroes of Motherhood. And I do have a link to that in the show notes. I'm really proud of that book because I do know some really awesome moms and they'll never be recognized. And you'll, if you don't know them, you wouldn't know who they are. But, you know, there are some really amazing and awesome moms out there and they really do need to be recognized. So let's go over these items one more time. One, do a two minute tidy in the room of your choice every night. Two, look at your calendar. Three, write down the next day's to-do list. Four, pack lunches for the next day. Five, put homework in folders and backpacks. Six, load the dishwasher or wash the dishes. Seven, pick out clothes for the next day. Eight, go to sleep at the same time each evening or at least go to bed and read a book or do something else to wind down for a good night's sleep. Think you can't do all this in 15 minutes? Okay, what if it takes 30? Is it worth it to have a smoother, happier morning to do these things in the evening? I will tell you, it certainly was for me especially while I was trying to wrangle three non-morning children (laughs) out the door. (laughs) Again, I always suggest try it for 30 days. Tell me how it goes. You know, most kids are wrapping up their school year right now, even the kids who are doing school online. So you can even take that little piece out of it. You can take the backpack piece out of it and you might be able to take the lunch piece out of it. So then how much, how much time is it really going to take you? Seriously, give this stuff a try. It will change your life. I'm telling you. You know, I really was one of those people that when I heard that a great morning starts the night before, I remember thinking that is the craziest thing I have ever heard. But then I tried these things that I'm talking about and dang it, they work. You know, as much as I didn't believe they would, they did. (laughs) And I still do the vast majority of these things every evening. Obviously no backpackers anymore, but you know, there are still nights when my husband is is in town. We make sure the lunch is all accounted for and everything. You know, the nights that I do these things, the mornings always seem to go better. The nights that I skip it, everything seems to be more difficult. That doesn't mean you can't readjust, but why start out difficult if you don't have to? It constantly amazes me how well that thing, how well all of that works. So I want you to check out the show notes for all the extra goodies that are related to this podcast. And if you have any questions, you can always email me at what's up at moving toward better.com. Guys, I want you to have a great morning. And that all starts the evening before. Until next time. I love you all. And I hope you have a great day. Keep moving towards better. See you guys. Love you. Bye-bye. At movingtowardbetter.com, it's our mission to help you live your best life and let the rest go. If you want to make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the podcast today. And then go to our website, movingtowardbetter.com, to sign up to be part of our email community. That way... You'll always have access to all the moving toward better fun and shenanigans. As always, thanks for listening. Thanks for being you and have a great day. Love you all.